Dr. Robert McDermott is a very close dear friend of mine, and he is Professor Emeritus of CIAS, and since 2000, he's been professor in the CIS program in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness. He has many books. Some of them are The Essential Aurobindo, The Spirit of Modern India, The Bhagavad Gita in the West, American Philosophy in Rudolf Steiner, The New Essential Steiner, and Steiner in Kindred Spirits. And from 1955, Robert was an unofficial student and friend of Thomas Berry. In 1964, Thomas officiated at the wedding of Robert and his wife, Ellen. And throughout the following 25 years, Ellen baked many dozens of brownies and cookies for Thomas. <laughs> so talk about keeping him alive. Um, Robert and Ellen's son is named Darren Thomas. And Thomas wrote an essay on Sri Aurobindo's Foundation of Indian Culture for a book titled Six Pillars, an introduction to the major works of Sri Aurobindo that Robert edited in 1973. And Thomas arranged for Robert to replace him on a Fulbright grant to the Open University for the academic year of 1975 to 76. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Robert McDermott. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hello all again. Oh, it's a great pleasure to talk about Thomas Berry. I can't think that I've done it before. It's, um, saying that as I was leaving home this morning. This is, this is very special. And so thank you for all of the people who invited me. It's a great pleasure. And thank you all for coming. Um, so I could, it would take many hours uh, to summarize Thomas's thought or, and it would be hopeless to try to give, you know, a few sentences in my own words, but that's okay because I have a paragraph by none other than uh, Mary Evelyn Tucker from the Evening Thoughts, uh, from the Latin texts of the Church Fathers, to the Sanskrit texts of Hinduism and Buddhism, to the Chinese classics of Confucianism and Taoism, Thomas's search for an understanding of the guiding forces of the human journey was intense, persistent, and rare. He sought grounding in the past as a means of reading the demands of the present and anticipating the needs of the future. He anticipated by several decades the need to understand other cultures and religions, and he foresaw the environmental crisis before it loomed in public consciousness. Um, first off, she knows what she's talking about. Second, she can write. So if you want to know about ecology, religion, Thomas Berry. Um, so, I, what would I do in a 10 minute reflection on Thomas Berry? I could tell you some of his thoughts, some phrases that have been in my mind for 60 years, some expressions. Uh, and after he would come for brownies, I would say, well, Ellen, you've nourished him, but he's gonna kill himself in that car. Uh, he, he drove very quickly um, and slightly alarmingly, uh, but fortunately he had a great long life to the advantage of everyone. Um, so um, I was in, in anticipation, I was thinking, what are the qualities or the statements, the, the accomplishments that people would uh, celebrate? And it occurred to me that I would say what I have noticed many times over the years, uh, but it's not often said. And that is, I want to say a little bit about his reverence. So Thomas was a priest. He was a scholar, he was a prophet, and yes, perhaps it was better that he was a prophet than that he was a priest. Um, I don't know, I thought he had priestly qualities that were, uh, were quite remarkable. But the reverence that I want to talk about is that in each of his, the phases of his life, he contributed, but he also drew, um, drew from certain experiences and challenges in a way that I would characterize by reverence. So it starts from what we from what we know from documents when he was nine, facing the meadow, and he concluded that that would be a really good measure, standard criterion for human affairs, for human relationships, for morality. 
Well, that's an experience of deep reverence. You look at the meadow, say, yeah, you really, you have a numinous quality, as Thomas did, and as he was able to generate for those of us who were looking to him. Um, he joined a, uh, an order of priests, um, monks, um, to be a priest and also to study and to write. And I don't think he ever left, I don't think he ever gave up or lost that, the reverence of that community. Um, Thomas had a hard institutional life and, and the Passionate Fathers um, uh, community he had it hard. He had it hard at uh, Seton Hall. He had it hard at St. John's. St. John's, an extraordinary thing happened. He was the mediator between the faculty and the administration. And after it was settled, the administration fired him. It was actually a good thing because he got to Fordham, which was more where he belonged. Uh, and, but there again, you know, he was trying to do comparative religion and they were doing theology. That's it. So in each of these challenges, um, Thomas, I think, uh, even when he was angry, and I did see him angry, he was angry in a just cause. That is to say, he was angry that some injustice is being done. He wasn't angry for himself. He was angry because this is not good. This is not good for theology, not good for philosophy, not good for schools, not good for students. It wasn't so much not good for me. And so again, it was, a, it was a, an attitude, a deep uh, developed ability uh, of uh, reverence. And so um, then when he was ordained, he took the name uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas Aquinas. And again, it was an act of reverence for this, the great philosopher, theologian, saintly person. And, so, and that was deep inside him, as, as Matt said. Uh, so then when he was doing cultural history and his dissertation and his work on, on Vico, uh, he had a, uh, a reverent awe for history, for what happens, why and how, and how do we understand it, and how can we improve on the next stage. It was a tremendously um, historical kind of prophetism, as Mary Evelyn said. He understood the past, the present, and he anticipated the future. So I think the first uh, of his writings that I read was an International Philosophical Quarterly, 1960, which was the first, he had the first article in the first issue. Uh, and he called it Oriental Religions. It was actually, uh, no, I think he called it uh, Oriental Philosophies. Get it confused? Um, but it was about the five teachings, Hinduism, Buddhism, Zen, etc. And that was his career then, comparative religion. So I, I studied Hinduism, and at, actually at St. John's, Hinduism, and Buddhism, Chinese civilizations, and in Fordham, I studied Sanskrit with him. And that was, that was who he was. He was a person who had deep scholarly reverence for the traditions. There was nothing critical in what he, uh, in what he taught, what he wrote. It was all celebratory. In fact, I remember him, I, I didn't know who Du Fu was, but he kept saying, stupendous, stupendous. I'm thinking, what's so, what's so stupendous? Uh, but that was his, it was a signature that these define these stupendous, these great insights, these etc. for which he had and communicated uh, great reverence. Um, I suppose I should include that uh, when I was in my teens, he was answering the bell at the monastery in Jamaica and that was his assignment and not allowed to talk to the seminarians, but he was able to talk to anybody who came. And I was waiting tables in a, in a retreat house next door and I got to know him and that I could sit in on his course on Dante. I didn't understand a word, but what I did get is what I think many people got from Thomas Berry, the uh, privilege of watching someone who loved what he was talking about, who loved the ideas, he loved the language. In fact, he studied Italian in order to study Dante. So this, you get the sense, even as I remember, I was 15 years old, and looking at, that's, this, this is important. This person, the way he speaks about what he knows is like gifts, like, like, like gifts to be shared. Um, 
And um, so if we go through his works, I think you will see he has um, a, uh, a rare ability to, uh, in fact, Mary, I want to use that word rare, uh, the ability to draw from the past, bring it to the present in a way that enables us to make a, uh, a more creative, uh, not just safer, but more aligned. Uh, in the end, I think Thomas in, added to all of his many paradigms, uh, I think in a very deep way, he added Confucianism because of its emphasis on a cooperative world. And that's what he was doing, I think. He was trying to create us in, to be cooperative with each other, with the earth, with the cosmos, with the past, the present, and in order to serve the future. So those of us who knew him and those of you who are coming to know him, be aware that it is a great privilege. Thank you.